Tonight we're going to do the missions model. <clears throat> I got here, I wanted to introduce Olek, but I, I got here in time to hear, I think, most of what he said. Uh, he wouldn't tell you this, but he was offered a full ride to Wheaton, everything, Wheaton Graduate School in 1993. And uh, he asked me what to do. And I said, well, you should probably take it. I, I said, well, tell, tell me what you want to do in your life. And Alec is really an intellectual. I, I happen to, uh, and he used, to, he used to have a British accent. It's flattened out a lot. <laughs> and uh, if you know anything about the, you know, British accent doesn't make an argument more true, but it makes it more plausible. <laughs> and if you know anything about J. Vernon McGee, he doesn't just have a southern accent, he has an Appalachian accent. He sounds like he just fell off a turnip truck. <laughs> you know, us southerners, we, uh, we talk like this to keep our opponents overconfident. <laughs> and uh, so for me to imagine Halleck Shefkun as the radio voice of J. Vernon McGee, I mean, that's just the wildest thing I could possibly imagine. But I asked him what he wanted to do, and, and I honestly thought he would say, I want to be a professor or I want to do uh, apologetics, or I want to be a professor of, uh, I want to teach literature, uh, Russian and English literature at a Christian college. And I would say, well, definitely get yourself to Wheaton. And I know we have Wheaton people here, so forgive me for telling you exactly what he said and exactly what I said, but uh, he said, I want to preach the gospel. And I said, well, if you want to preach the gospel, maybe you should go to Dallas and learn how to be an expositor. But I don't know where the money's going to come from. And he said, well, that's God's problem, isn't it? And God provided everything. And he, he said no to a full ride, all expenses, because he wanted to preach the gospel. I think that's a stupefying thing. Um, now, tonight we're doing the missions model. The time has gone quickly. It's a model that we should be really... Uh, interested in, I think, obviously. I want to talk a little bit about the man who wrote the book of Acts. I think you might find some correspondences in your own life. If you were to ask most of us, if we hadn't looked it up or someone hadn't told us already, if you were to ask most of us who wrote most of the New Testament, I think most of us would say Paul, and most of us would be wrong. Paul wrote more books. Now, if you count Hebrews, which I don't, my opinion is not important on that question, but um, which I don't, if you count Hebrews, then Paul wrote most of the New Testament, or the plurality. And um, if you don't count Hebrews, the number of words in Luke Acts is more than the number of words in Paul's 13 epistles, which is a stunning thing. Now, <clears throat> What if you were considering a ministry that had already been done and the abiding effects of that finished ministry were accruing to the benefit of the whole world and Christians everywhere? And what if you were considering repeating a ministry that had already been done perfectly? And what if you were considering doing a ministry that had already been done, been done perfectly, but had been done twice? perfectly. And what if you were considering doing a ministry that had been done twice perfectly by people who had insuperable advantages over you because they knew the principle whereas you were trying to get everything second hand. So if Luke had said now what do we need another gospel for? We've already, we'd already have two perfect gospels and I, I could probably be better deployed doing something else in the body, and that, that'd be a very good argument. I mean, it'd be hard to gainsay that argument. If Luke had caved in to that argument, you would not know the meaning of prodigal son. You would not know the meaning of good Samaritan. Uh, you would know nothing about the ascension. You would know nothing about the man who wrote Romans. You would know hardly anything about the birth narratives of 
the Son of God. There, there were four hymns at Christmas. There was the Benedictus of Zecharias. There was the, um, the Magnificat of Mary. There was a Gloria in Excelsis Deo of the angels. And there was the Nuc Dimittis, Now Let Thy Servant Depart, of, of Simeon. We would have no hymns of Christmas. We would know nothing of the manger, nothing of the angels, nothing of the shepherds. Think how impoverished we would be because he didn't let his ego get in the way and say, well, you know, I, I know it's been done twice. I know it's been done perfectly. I know it's been done better. I know there's probably nothing I could add, but I, I'll be available. Now, why did he do that? Did he do that because he knew he was going to give us all those things that we wouldn't have gotten otherwise? No. Did he, did he do what he did because he knew he was going to write most of the New Testament, the plurality of words in the New Testament? No. He did it to serve one person. Some of us, we hear about the Saddlebacks and we hear about the Willow Creeks. And we hear about the North Points and we hope we can get 40 this Sunday. And some of us think, you know what, if I ever get as many people on a worship service as appear in the choir at First Baptist Dallas, I'm going to shout hallelujah. And yet, one person called Theophilus, and you know, Christians guess, nobody really knows. Uh, some people think that Luke, is, Luke acts as a catechism and that Theophilus is a new Christian. I, I personally don't think he's there yet. I think he's almost there. I think he knows it's true, but he's still got a lot of questions. He hasn't made a commitment, and Luke is helping to get him over the hump. I'm very confident we're going to see him in, in heaven. Luke found one person who didn't know nearly as much as he did, and that person was named Theophilus, and he committed to serving him. Luke found one person who knew a lot more than he did. That person's name was Paul, and he committed to serving him. And that's why we have this explosive, glorious dynamic that ended up something called Luke, Luke Acts. Now, I'm far from a model. I, I'm more like a warning. But I, I don't like to use the word mentor. I don't like to use the word missionary about myself. I'm thuddingly, embarrassingly monolingual, incompetent, culturally clueless. I, I, I like to say I'm a Christian worker who doesn't live at home. And, and I don't like to say I'm a, I'm a mentor. One reason I don't like to say this is because the, the, the young men that I persuade myself that I'm mentoring, they might get offended or surprised if they knew that I was their mentor. There's six people I meet with regularly. They're all, they all preach. Four Russians, an American, and a Filipino that Oleg mentioned. And I, I view myself as their servant. And it's hard for me to get out of the way and, and serve them. It's hard because a couple of them uh, get to preach sometimes instead of me. And that's hard for me because I'm so prideful. When we lived in Moscow in the early 90s, my, our son was the youngest player on the Hinkson Christian Academy basketball team. And my son was a football player, not a basketball player. And he would... Um, he didn't, know, he didn't know what was happening on the court when he got thrown in there during garbage, what we call garbage time, two or three minutes at the end. And he didn't realize that the other players were not throwing the ball to him when he was open. They would wait to find somebody out when he was obviously open. I'm sure he was probably relieved. He was not conscious that they weren't throwing the ball. But I'm his dad, and take it by faith, I actually played basketball in high school. And uh, <laughs> uh, I don't want to derange you for the rest of the time trying to imagine that, but... Uh, I, of, of course, I could I could tell what was happening, and it was and as I was sitting there grieving with a father's heart, grieving for my son, understanding what was being played out in front of my eyes, uh, the Holy Spirit whispered, "Ronnie, you do that. You do that at church. 
Because if you think you can do something better than somebody else, you've never thrown the ball. And uh, you, we have to throw the ball to people who are not quite ready. How are they going to get ready if we never throw them the ball? Uh, Alec uh, preached a sermon about two months ago from John 3. Now, let me continue to confess my arrogance. You know, if you preach a sermon from 1 Chronicles 3 or if you preach a sermon from Ezekiel 3, I expect to learn something. I think, hot diggity, I'm going to learn a bunch of stuff I don't know. If you preach a sermon from John 3, I, I think, no way. and no way you're going to teach me something I don't know. And there were three things in that sermon that I'd never seen before. And I just thought, how could he do that? You know, and the, it's because God has not chosen to, to teach all of us everything we need to know. He's chosen to tell us what he wants us to know through other people. Some people who are younger than we, some people who are more disadvantaged than we, some people who haven't been believers or had the privileges of study like we have. Plus, this, this is a living book. We never get to the end of it. You know, you can, you can get to the place where you've said almost all you can say about the Brothers Karamazov. Great as that novel is but you never get that way with Holy Scripture. Never. Because it's a living thing. It's the product of an infinite mind. And it's going to take an eternity for us to contemplate the infinite. We're, not, we're going to know so much more the day we arrive, but we're, we're never going to know it all because we're never going to be God. A trillion years from now in heaven, none of us will be omniscient. We'll still be learning. And in heaven, we will have two exquisite sensations simultaneously that we can only enjoy uh, separately on earth the sensation of uh, a novelty a new adventure and the sensation of finally being at home and you know how exquisite that is you, your first day of a holiday you're going somewhere you've never been before maybe you're going to the tropics maybe you're going to Alaska maybe you're going to Africa and you're, you're so excited, but, you know, three weeks later, you're pretty happy to get home, aren't you? And be in your own bed. And both those things, simultaneously and perpetually, that's a part, only a small part of what heaven is, part of the, part of the joys of heaven. I have two, really I have three mentors, and one is 15 years younger than I, and it's hard for me because I can never spend any time with them. I hope to see one of them. Uh, next week and uh, uh, one is a Presbyterian minister in Glasgow, one's a Presbyterian minister in, in Birmingham, Alabama and one is an Iranian who's the smartest person I've ever known. D. Phil Oxford, PhD Cambridge, MD and THM Dallas Seminary. Now what he does in his spare time I don't know. He did it all in a second language and he risks his life in country about seven months out of the year. I'm just totally in awe of him. Anytime I'm with him, he's the most humble person you'd ever be around. So find somebody who knows more than you and serve them. That's what Luke did. And find somebody who, who knows less than you and serve them. Figure out a way to serve them. And don't despise the day of small things. Hudson Taylor said, a little thing is a little thing, but faithfulness in a little thing is a big thing. And that's so, that's, that's obvious, isn't it? It's, one, it's a wonderful thing. Now, by the time you get to the end of Acts 15, the gospel has only just been decisively defined. The first missionary journey, Acts 13 and, and 14 in Asia Minor, was conducted when there were a lot of early Christian leaders who were kind of wobbly about precisely what the gospel was. That's why they call the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. And they address questions like, well, what role does the law play? Well, are Gentiles going to be associate Christians and because the Jews are the, the real Christians, the full-fledged Christians? Uh, what, about, what about circumcision? Um, and, you know, these, Paul contended for the gospel that he received from Jesus, and, and he prevailed, and then they get ready to go out again. And toward the end of chapter 15, they decide that they're going back. It wasn't his original vision to blaze new trails. He birthed all these new believers in Acts 13 and 14, all in the churches of Asia Minor. 
and he would not leave them orphans. He was going to go back and follow up. He wasn't going to go new places. But in Acts 13, John Mark, who was on the, on the original team, he dropped out. And Barnabas, who was related by blood to John Mark, just assumed that, well, he's, he's ready to go now. And Paul says, he's not going. And Paul said, why not? And and Barnabas said, why not? He said, because he quit. And I can just imagine Mar Barnabas saying, well, yeah, you preach grace, don't you? But you don't always practice it, do you? And I can imagine Paul saying, you know what? I'm all for grace. And, and, and there's no breach in our relationship. But there are consequences to our decisions. And there are consequences of him walking away when we needed him. And I'm not saying he can never go again, but he's got to sit this one out. And Paul Barnabas said he doesn't need to sit this out. Now, I told you the first night that there's a school of thought that um, accuses Joseph of sin, or at least slovenliness and clumsiness, the way he shared the contents of the two dreams with his family. And there are more people who say, well, he certainly sinned by the way he deceived his his brothers now and, and I defended Joseph and I said it wasn't a sin absolutely wasn't a sin we don't need to go back over that now there are people they're great scholars I'm not a scholar I'm just a student like you are they're great scholars who second guess Paul through the book of Acts and they say things like you know he shouldn't have shaved his head he shouldn't have uh, he shouldn't have submitted uh, to circumcision for uh this person and that person and he shouldn't have uh, he should have preached in Athens he should have preached a different sermon too, too uh, heavy on cultural apologetics and too light on the gospel and the scripture and that's why there was no church planted that's why there wasn't a great result you know all that all that's baloney I'm sorry because you know maybe you preached on that last Sunday but um, yeah of course Paul made mistakes and, and, and the reason I mention this is because there are a lot of people who say, now we know that Barnabas was right and Paul was wrong because in his last letter, uh, Paul talks about how useful uh, John Mark is to him. And, and by the way, John Mark wrote the second gospel, so God wasn't finished with him. Well, Paul wasn't finished with him either. Uh, it, is, it was no part of Luke's purpose to highlight the errors of the Apostle Paul. Paul was Luke's hero. He was the missionary apostle par excellence. And that's what Luke is doing with the book of Acts. And I would argue the very reason he was useful by 2 Timothy, the re very reason he was uh, qualified to write the second gospel is because Paul kicked his tail off the team and taught him, son, if, if you're going to be, if you're going to travel with the apostles, you need to learn to finish with the apostles. And he wouldn't have absorbed that lesson if he said, oh, come on back, we love you. As he stood and realized he wasn't going, you know, they go, to, they go to Cyprus and you don't really ever hear much about Barnabas anymore. After Acts 12, Paul is mentioned over 120 times. I think the Holy Spirit has settled the controversy in who he's shown the light on in ministry. But now there's something else here. And I may even get to Acts 16 in a minute, but I think there's something that's also vital for us. The fact that they couldn't agree and that they split up is, is stupefying. And we're thinking, they're full of the Holy Spirit. Um, they are privileged. You know, it's debatable on, over whether we call Barnabas an apostle. He is called an apostle, but we don't know how formal that is. Um, but he's certainly apostolic in his rank and what he d did. How on earth could they fall out and split up? You know, I'm so grateful that we have incidents like this reported. I'm deeply, deeply grateful for two reasons. Number one, it, it proves that the Bible is true. It proves that nothing is whitewashed. Uh, nothing is airbrushed. Uh, I'm so glad that we learn about those two women in, in Philippi, Yodi and Syntyche. I'm so glad we learn about the mess that Corinth was. I'm so glad we know about the controversy between the Palestinian and the Hellenistic widows in Acts 6. 
I'm so glad the, the Holy Spirit is faithful to include all that and writers like Luke and Paul are faithful to, to, to call attention to that and not, not dodge it and refuse to talk about it because it's so embarrassing. I mean, can you imagine having your name written in the Bible because you can't get along with a woman? That's what happened in Philippians. And, but there's another reason I'm grateful. For. It not only shows the thing is true because the, the blemishes are highlighted as well as the triumphs, but it, I'm glad because it makes me hope. You know, if I read about New Testament ministry and they never had any problems, I'd give up. I would say, well, there's, there's no possible way God could have his hand on my ministry because I had nothing but problems. But when I look at their ministries and see the challenges that they faced, and I know that in spite of it all, I mean, Paul and Barnabas split up. That's horrible. And yet, and yet, God was about to do something stupendous. It gives me great, great encouragement. So they do split up, and Silas takes Barnabas's place, and uh, Barnabas takes Mark and goes away to Cyprus, and in Acts 16, they arrive in Asia Minor. Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra. Now, I gotta say this. Lystra is the place, and some of, I'm sure John and Esther have been by there. I go pretty near Lystra on my uh, twice yearly uh, itineration through Turkey, and, and uh, Lystra is the place where Paul was stoned and left for dead. And, you know, I've, <coughs> I haven't always made a good impression on people, but nobody's ever stoned me. I'm sure they've thought about it, but they've never actually done it. Think about that. Would you call that a ministry success? Do you know what happened after Paul was stoned and he recovered? And his, and his recovery was a miracle because there was no convalescence. Some people even think he may have been raised from the dead. That might be pushing it a little bit, but we can't know for sure that it wasn't that. We know that his, his recovery was miraculous. So what does he do? He goes straight back into Lystra. You know, Henry Blackaby and the great ministry he had in Canada, and he distilled the, the principle that he worked by. Find out what God is blessing and join him. Find out what God is blessing and do more of it. Would you have gone back to Lystra? And that's a very, very instructive pattern of ministry, missions, evangelism, uh, in what happens with Paul in Acts 14 in Lystra. Now, now, that, now, as they go back to um, Asia Minor for the second missionary journey, he goes to Lystra again. And I'm thinking, how could you do that? They tried to kill you there. He goes back to Lystra, and he discovers that he made such an positive impression on a young man who was watching him Maybe that young man even watched him get stoned like he watched Stephen get stoned in, in chapter 7 that somebody steps forward and wants to be a missionary. He had a Christian mother. He had a Christian grandmother. He, I guess he had a pagan dad. And we look at the smoking ruins of the apparently failed ministry in Lystra where the missionary gets stoned, attempted murder, and we find out, well, you know what? You actually did some good there. And the, the product of that ministry steps forward. And his name is Timothy. And, you know, Paul writes to the, Ephesians, uh, the, the Philippians and says, you know what? I don't have anybody. There isn't anybody better than Timothy. I'm going to send Timothy to you. I don't have anybody better. There isn't anybody better. So something that looked like an absolute, total failure produced this wonderful, wonderful Timothy. And so he joins the apostolic team. Now it's Paul, Silas, and Timothy. And so uh, they, they set out. Um, and it says in verse 6 that they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak 
the word in Asia. Now, this is a, this is a succession of closed doors, frustration upon frustration, forbidden in Asia. Of course, that's the Roman province of Asia Minor, what we call Turkey. When they came up to Mycenae, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. It doesn't say that the, the Romans or the pagans or the devil worshipers didn't allow them. It says that the Spirit of God didn't allow them. And we would love to know details, but we don't. So they went down to Troas, that's a port, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia. Now, what's significant in that sentence? Luke has joined the apostolic band. It goes from third person to first person. So now here's a, th you know, here's the second vocation of this glorious gospel writer. He started out as a physician, he became a missionary, then he became a writer. So there's several of you here in this room who are not doing what you originally started out doing. And there's several of you in this room who are not going to end up doing what you're doing now. And let, let God make that call. If you, uh, I'll give you one undecoded American football reference. God gets to call an audible at the line of scrimmage. If you don't know what that means, you're still virtuous to ask an American what that means. It means that God can say we're going here, and at the last minute he sends you there. And so they conclude. It's interesting that Paul is the visionary. Paul is the anointed one. Paul is the, the one who's conversed face to face with Jesus post ascension. And yet we concluded, and he's the one who saw the vision, but he has to recruit the team to buy into the vision, and that's what he does. He doesn't say, follow me, I'll explain later. Only God can do that. So there, there's a buy in. We sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, there is in that paragraph a clarification of call. My favorite missionary, who I think is the greatest speaker whom I've ever heard in my life, happens to be a woman, Dr. Helen Rosevear. She went to glory about two years ago. If you ever heard her, you probably had third-degree burns left on your cheeks. She was unbelievable, and she combined three things, one of which we encounter quite often, the two in combination, much more rarely, the three in combination, almost never, great gifts with great commitment with great suffering. And she didn't like, she didn't like the idea of a call. She, her understanding of the New Testament is that all Christians are called, and she made a great case for it, and if she were here she would out-debate me, no doubt about it. Uh, and I think she was frustrated because she believed that Christians would use the lack of a call as an excuse not to do something for the Great Commission. And, you know, I, far be it from me to disagree with Helen Rosevear, but some of us got to have a sense of a call. Maybe it's because we're weak or we're babies. I don't know. I need a sense of a call. You know, some, some days you're getting nothing. Some days you look at that donor report and you say, well, I'm not getting rich. Some day you listen to a deacon or a woman in the church telling you what your gifts aren't. You're not getting much from them. Some day you're not sure if your family's really on your team. Sometimes those people back at headquarters, you think, do they just exist to multiply tasks for me? Is that what they're called to do, to give me something else to fill out? What do they do for Jesus? I know all of you are much too godly ever to have thought that, but I'm a lousy carnal guy. Okay, and, 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 you know, and someday all we've got is the call. Maybe there's not much results in the people we're trying to minister to. Someday, sometimes all we've got is the call. I think God wants me to do this. That's why I do it. I'm doing it for accolades. I haven't had any accolades. I don't do it because people are, want to write a book about me or do a, a documentary on me or because anybody's ever noticed me. I do it because I think the Lord wants me to do it. And you know what? That's enough. 
If we got that, we don't need anything else. We may want other things, but we don't have to have anything else. And there was a clarification of the call. Now, God can call us in many ways. He can call us in an overtly supernatural way. I know many Christians are discount that. Dr. John MacArthur discounts that. Um, and, I mean, I've never had a, a vision. An angel has never appeared to me. If, if he did, I'd probably jump out the window. And, 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 and I think if an angel does appear to you, don't seek that. Because that means something really hard is about to happen. Mary, you're going you're gonna to get pregnant before you spend the night with a man. And everybody's going to think they know why you got pregnant, and they're going to be wrong. That's why an angel was sent. Or Joseph, your fiance is pregnant, and, and I know and you know that you're not the father. But it's okay. It's okay. It's of God. She hasn't been unfaithful to you. It's, it, it's of God. And we're being fortified for something hard. Um, and, and, and I personally don't rule out the category. We don't know. I, had, I was with a young man, a, a young Macedonian in Serbia on Sunday. I preached at his church, and, and he, he said, I don't, I, don't, I don't think God ever speaks today. And all that's gone. I said, what are you going to do when the two witnesses show up in Revelation 11? Are you going to say that they can't speak for God? They can't bring a message to God? How will you treat them if you're alive in that generation? How's that going to fit into your theological paradigm? Now, we don't get, need to get into that debate. Maybe you're more conservative than me. Maybe you're much more open than me. Maybe you're hearing from God every day. I don't know. But that is something God did in Scripture. And I don't think it's wild and outlandish to assume that what God did in Scripture, he may do tomorrow. Okay. The second way God can call us is he can call us through a verse. And... Uh, and obviously, it sure looks like when we do this or when other people do this that they're taking verses out of context. And there's some merit to that objection. And there are ways that God has led us through passages of Scripture that I would not care to try to defend in front of a seminary professor. I can't do it hermeneutically. I can't make a great case for my take on that verse in a scholarly way. But you know, there's some things that you can't defend, but you also can't deny. They're just there. And I would ask the question, um, can't, if God doesn't speak to his people through his word, how does he speak to his people? We lost... Uh, a son at birth, November 7th, 1981. This is one reason Alexei is so special to us. He was born the same year. And our, our son was born dead. And it was by far the hardest thing that ever happened to us. And there are many, many things that have happened to you that are much harder, much harder. But it's the hardest thing um, that's ever happened to us. And when we were struggling with whether we are going to go overseas or not, uh, we kind of realized the way the schedule was playing out what was happening in Munich, what was happening in North Carolina, that probably Jane was going to have to uh, travel in the seventh month of the next pregnancy. And, uh, and also, Jane wasn't quite on board. And, um, and I, I drove five hours to meet my best friend before I made this wild decision to leave America. And basically, he only said one thing. He said, don't go unless Jane feels really good about it. And I thought, well, then we're not going. That settles it, you know, because she doesn't feel good about it. When I drove back into my driveway, driving from Columbia, South Carolina, to Moorhead City, North Carolina, uh, I could see Jane through the window walking around, big tummy, holding a Bible like this. And I thought, wow. So um, I walk into the kitchen, and I look at her, and she looks at me, and I said, what? What's happening? She said, we're going to Munich. I said, we are? <laughs> and i just been thinking for five hours, we're going to stay in America. And I said, why? And she said, the Lord's giving me a verse. How amiable are the tabernacles, O Lord. How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. 
Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house, even singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you and in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Now, I know the hermeneutical objections to applying those verses to our case, but to paraphrase Luther, birds can't read. I know that's a verse about swallows, okay? But birds can't read the Bible. And by the way, it wasn't the next pregnancy. It was two pregnancies afterwards. The next pregnancy, we almost lost him too. He was in the hospital 11 days. Respiratory difficulty. So we were a little bit nervous about, about having babies. And she's a 32-year-old godly woman getting ready to graduate from Dallas Seminary. And, you know, the birth was just fine and wonderful. Okay, so sometimes he uses scripture. He speaks in his word. God speaks in his word. Surely we can agree on that. Um, God, <clears throat> I know this is dangerous. God sometimes speaks directly. Now, this is very subjective, and because it's subjective, it's open to all kinds of misuse and abuse and Mistakes, I know that. But um, there are too many biblical paradigms to rule it out. And I'm not, I'm not talking about an audible voice. God did speak in, audible, in an audible voice to some of his servants because where the timber of God's voice was described. It was like the sound of a waterfall. It was like, uh, it was like the sound of, of many waters. Um, the scripture says that uh, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. This is Psalm 32, 8. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. And what God is saying is, look, don't be somebody that I have to do this to. Look at me. Don't be somebody that I have to do this to to get your attention. There's some dogs who require a leash, and with some dogs, only the master's voice is necessary. Let's try to be that second kind of dog. And the Lord talks about how this happens, how he gets our attention and how we listen to him. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. You've got your eyes on God's eyes, I, it sounds mystical, and we don't need to try to break it down and describe it practically. Let's just let the scripture speak. We don't have time to justify everything. We're so close to the Lord that we see his eyes, like Dave was telling us about his wife's look. Well, we also need to be intimate with the Lord's look. And the Lord just kind of goes like this, and we think, well, it's over there. I saw, I saw his look. I'm confident, I'm confident I know what he wants. Oswald Chambers said that, I, that Isaiah was so close to the Lord that he could hear the Lord talking to himself. And that when the Lord says, whom shall I send, Isaiah jumps up and says, well, here I am, you could send me. <laughs> now, I know, I know that's fanciful. I know that's a literary technique. I'm not trying to brand that in boilerplate is the way you find out God's will, okay? I'm just talking about various ways that God can do it. God can do it what, by what uh, Elizabeth Elliot called a, a, um, a slow and certain light. That was the name of her book on finding the will of God. It's the light of Proverbs 4.18. The path of the just is like the first gleam of dawn, which at first is just a flicker but it gets brighter and brighter as the day wears on. Here's what that means. You think God is setting you on a path. You start walking on that path. The longer you're on that path, the, the more obvious God's will becomes. The brighter the path becomes. Your assignment becomes clearer. You know what that means? It means you're on the right path. You're going in the right direction. Or you can have the opposite experience. You think you know the direction to go. You start going in that direction. Things get darker. And 
It doesn't mean that the circumstances don't fall together. Please make that distinction, okay? I'm not saying that everything is going to be easy. That's not the message I'm trying to get across. You would think if God had his hand on them, she wouldn't have to travel in her ninth month. You would think if they were doing what God wanted them to do, that there would be a room she could have her baby in. But she did travel in the ninth month. And there wasn't a room. She brought forth her firstborn son in a stable, and she wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and she laid him in a manger. Was that easy? No. Did God care about them? More than anybody who's ever lived. Circumstances and difficulty are not the arbiter of whether you're in the will of God or not. That's not what I'm saying. But it's when the intimacy with God starts to fade, and your sense that, you know, he's with you and, and he's showing you when that gets dim, turn around and go back. There's another way. And yesterday was Reformation Sunday. Not Sunday, Reformation Day. Uh, there's another way. And that's compulsion. Uh, forgive me, German speakers. Luther said, Here stehe ich, ich kann nicht anders. Here I stand. I can't do anything else. At the Diet of Worm, I have to do this. He didn't set out to reform the church. He didn't want to nominate himself. He said, I couldn't help it. Is it biblical? Yes, it's biblical. 1 Corinthians 9. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. You don't need to give me credit for the choices I've made or what to do in my life. I can't help it. I would die if I didn't do this. John Knox said, give me Scotland or I die. And some of you do what you do because you can't help it. You know what? That's a call. That's a call. Don't feel like you've got to explain that in any sort of elaborate way. You do it because you can't help it. These men were called supernaturally by a vision. And They determine that God has uh, called them. I love this. We, we concluded that God wanted us to preach, so we set sail. And they arrive in Philippi. Now, what happens here is epical. It's momentous. You know, what, you know what's about to happen? The birth of the West. This is the birth of the West, Acts 16. Secular scholars will tell you that the glory of the West was engendered by Greece and Rome. That's a lie. Greece and Rome gave us infanticide. Greece and Rome gave us temple prostitution. Greece and Rome gave us slavery the subjugation of conquered peoples by slaughter and crucifixion. Christianity gave us abolition of slavery. Christianity gave us abolition of child labor. Christianity gave us hospitals. Christianity gave us the elevation of women. Christi Christianity gave us educational institutions. Christianity gave us science, ironically. Christianity gave us a concern for the rights of the individual. It's the Judeo-Christian tradition that birthed the West, and it happens here. About, I don't know, six years ago, I was witnessing on the streets in, in Budapest, and I encountered this man, young man. He looked like a movie star, and he was so beautifully dressed. He was, he was South African, Gordon, and he was, he was mixed race, very handsome, very beautifully dressed. The only way I knew he was a Muslim was because of what he had on his head. So I began to engage him, and he was formidable. Boy, he had answers. And I'd, I'd strike a blow, and I'd think, he'll never recover from that. But he did, and he'd strike a blow against me. And so we were going at it, and I thought, boy, this kid is good. I wish I'd studied more. 
you know. And uh, finally, I looked at him, and I loved him like Christ loved the rich young ruler. You know, I, I, he was a slave to a false religion, and he was a proselytizer for a false religion. But there was something beautiful about him as a human being. And I found myself liking him. And finally, I looked at him and said, I want to ask you a question. He said, what? I said, why do 90% of Muslims who live in places where Sharia is honored, if they could bring their whole families with them, why would they choose to live in the West? Why would they choose to live in a place based on Judeo-Christian tradition? And his expression changed, and he hung his head. He had... He was brilliant in every repartee, but he was so honest, he had so much integrity that he told the truth. He hung his head and he looked up at me and he said, I don't have a good answer for that. Yeah, they, they may want to uh, enforce Sharia, but they don't want to live in the places where Sharia has been enforced. And I'm thinking, why do you want to come here and make our society as hellish as the one you fled. Have you not connected those dots? Do you see no connection there? Okay, so what do I mean by the birth of the West? The disciples are listing east. They're going back to Turkey. The vision from Macedon, of the Macedonian man tur turns them around. And instead of going east, they cross the Aegean going west, and they pitch up on the shore of Macedonia, and they're in Philippi. And the west is about to be birthed. Had they continued east, eastward, China may have become the equivalent of Britain. Muammar may have become the equivalent of France. Um, Kazakhstan may have become the, the equivalent of the United States. Who knows? But that's not what happened. They go west. Now, where do they go? They go to the place. They go to a place of prayer. They, there's no synagogue there, which means there are not ten believing Jews. But they find a place of prayer by the the riverside. And the women came to the prayer meeting. Some things never change. <laughs> now, don't ever underestimate what a few women committed to prayer can do. I just told you the, the West is about to be birthed. Why was the West birthed? Well, because the apostles came. What fetched the apostles? The prayers of these women. Now, there's also an irony here. Paul so wanted to go, and get ready for a plug for international churches, Paul so wanted to go back to Asia Minor. He doesn't. He's forced to go into Europe. Who's the first person who's converted in Western Europe? A woman from Asia Minor. Thyatira. God wasn't abandoning Asia Minor. God was going to save someone from Asia Minor in northern Greece, in Macedonia, at, at Philippi. Her name was Lydia first convert that we know about on the European continent who was a worshiper of God we've got to go fast the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul and then we know she's converted because she begs them to come stay with her I love visitors for about eight hours and uh, eight days is too much and when people show you hospitality and beg you to stay by the way I'll say this really fast I know I've got to end this but uh, I first studied this when our second child was born. When our second child was born in 1984, I thought, well, hey, I've got a household. The obvious began to dawn. And then I realized that the first two households that the apostles visited in Europe s saw the conversion of the whole house, the entire household, Lydia and the Philippian jailer. And so I said, why? Why were their whole family saved? Are there any hints in the text? I found 12 reasons. 12 reasons why the Philippian jailer and Lydia saw their entire household saved so, so quickly. This is not a family conference, so we're not going to talk about it. But you, you dig. You dig. You'll probably find 13 or 14 or 15 or 20.
Okay, I I found twelve. Now, after Lydia gets saved, um, look at verse sixteen. As we were going to the place of prayer, what does that tell you? They didn't go to the religious meeting to cherry pick and to try to get people out of that meeting to their meeting. They continued to go to the established meeting to pray. Isn't that beautiful? They were not territorial. They were kingdom-minded. They were not trying to increase what they were going to start at the expense of what God had already started. And it says that day by day they were going back. Evidently, they were like the South Koreans. They had a prayer meeting every day, and the apostles went every day. And what happened is that as they went, there was a demonized girl who would station herself along their route, and she would cry out, verse 17, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Now, what's wrong with those words? Nothing. Those words are absolutely true. Then why was it a threat? Why was it something negative? Lots of reasons. Everybody knew she was weird and in league with the devil. Her endorsement would not help them. And the devil knew that. And the townspeople would think, well, golly, if they're, if, if they're rep leaders of her church, I don't want any part of it. And I'm sure that she didn't make the announcement in a normal way. I'm sure it was some weird, um, frightening intonation these men serve the Lord. Listen to them. You know, it was something that was a total turnoff, even though the content of what she said was true. Now, one thing that strikes me here is Paul's patience. He doesn't immediately get upset and fly off the handle. Evidently, this had gone on for uh, quite some time. It says in verse 18, she kept doing this for many days. And Paul, finally, greatly annoyed, turns and says to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Christ, come out of her. And the Spirit does. And she's free. And she's okay. Now, people my age spent most of their lives, I was born in 1950, and between 1950 to 1991 and beyond, I was told what horrible people the Russians were. Now, the Russians are not horrible people. I think communism is a horrible system. But, you know, so is capitalism. And the exploitative potential of capitalism is every bit as great as communism. Communism doesn't work economically. Capitalism does, but it can still be very mischievous spiritually. Capitalism works in the production of goods and in the uh, scoring of profit. It doesn't necessarily work spiritually. Quite the opposite. And guess who wants to kill Paul? The capitalists. He took away their income stream. He destroyed their basis for profit. So the first thing that happens in Europe is the capitalists attack Paul who's invaded their territory. And they, they seize Paul and they convince the rulers to throw him into jail. Now we're almost done. Uh, it says that the crowd joined in attacking them. It says that um, they were supposed to be beaten with rocks. Um, 